Glaciers are elders of the landscape. The rhythms of the mountains recorded by glaciers are cycles of climatic change. They are the annual rhythms of seasons, climatic cycles spanning tens of thousands of years, the ultimate force shaping the mountains and causing change to land and life. Despite this power, the rhythms are imperceptible. The beat slow and complicated, but inexorable. They can be seen and heard only by those who take the time to look and listen for them. I have had the privilege and the resources as a geologist to listen and learn. I came here because my father had been in Fort Lewis at the end of World War II, and he told me that this was the wildest place left in the lower 48 states. Now, my first real impression of the place was kind of built on that drive over the past, and uh, I was pretty humbled, pretty awestruck by it all. As a geologist, I'm interested in glaciers, I'm interested in landslides, rivers, and how they shape the landscape. Glaciers are extremely sensitive to climate change because they're affected by temperature and precipitation. So when climate changes, the glacier changes. When the glacier changes, particularly when it gets bigger, it leaves pretty indelible marks of how big it used to be. The glaciers record the cycles of climate change over many different time scales, and those are the rhythms that I spoke of in the book. The fact of the matter is there is a lot to learn from this place. You know, it is ironic that we use fossil fuels to monitor the glaciers, but spring avalanche danger and the weight of our gear require us to use helicopters in this country in the spring and fall. I've never seen anybody else up here. Never heard anything else. It feels to me like you're in a desert. The snow is sand and there's no trees or vegetation anywhere. So glaciers form where it is cold enough for the winter snow to last through the summer. Year after year of snow piling upon snow eventually builds a glacier. We come in in the spring with a backpack mounted steam drill that we use and it's got a, about a 12 meter long hose and a, a fiberglass rod with a brass nozzle on it and it jets steam out at pretty good pressure, usually 20 psi or more and that will melt through the snow, through last year's snow which we call fern and into the ice and in that we can drop these melt stakes. So our only job here today is to uh, measure the height of that stake, which will give us an idea of how much melting has occurred since we put it in at the end of April. That is telling us what's happening in a near real-time basis. We're 
basically measuring how much snow the glaciers accumulate in the winter and then how much of that snow and the ice beneath it that they lose in the summer. We remove these stakes because we won't find them next spring under 30 feet of snow and we need to break them into smaller pieces to get them into the helicopter. Many years uh, up at this higher part of the glacier we'll see five, six meters of melt in a really warm, sunny summer. Noisy Glacier is the lowest elevation glacier in our four glacier network here and uh, we're at about 5,600 feet. The lower in elevation you are, the warmer it is, the more melting there is. And uh, for Noisy Glacier, it's now cut off from the high accumulation zone to the south and east of us. In many years when we come back at this time of year, what we're seeing is that there's no snow left on this glacier from the previous winter. Okay, and so as a result of no ice feeding into this glacier, it's stagnating, okay, and it's sort of just melting in place. It's not being replenished by ice from higher up. So Noisy Glacier uh, is probably among the four that we're monitoring in this park is doing the worst. Climate change has the power to melt glaciers, but it also has the power to affect almost everything else in this valley, including lower elevations and my garden. Well, the garden I started, you know, I cleared the land and made the fence because there's a lot of animal pressure here, deer, bears, coyotes, bobcats. So I made a big fence and it took me a long time to build the soil up. And after that I built the orchard and I just built this pole building. The winters used to be a lot more severe in Marble Mountain 100 years ago. Uh, awfully cold and wet. Awfully big avalanches, awfully big piles of snow to shovel. I think you probably could have grown a garden here, but you know, the season would have been a lot shorter. And this is a tough place to grow things because when we get a really good accumulation of snow in the winter, and the glaciers build a lot in the winter, often that weather persists into May and June. So when the sun normally is highest, we have 30,000 feet of clouds. Not only is that retarding the glacier melting, it's limiting the growth of my garden. Place is very important to me, without a doubt. Getting your feet in the soil, you know, sending some roots down and living close to the land. To me, that's a big part of a fulfilled life is having some roots, right? Throughout this area, glaciers have shrunk dramatically in the last century. The loss of these should not be taken lightly. As they melt, we lose a vital part of these mountains. Obelisks of time, elders of the landscape, glaciers add immeasurably to the North Cascades. In fact, the modern cover of glaciers defines the region. Strung out like pearls on the backs of the mountains, the 700 plus glaciers in the North Cascades add greatly to the quality of lives by providing challenge and inspiration, as well as consistent runoff for salmon, irrigation, and hydroelectricity. Apparently, our glaciers will continue to wither in the heat of human consumption. Part of my current job is to monitor the health of four glaciers in the North Cascades. Noisy Glacier is one of the glaciers we visit three times every year. Since the late 1970s, there have been few good years for this glacier. The geologic records that I've been looking at uh, and some of the other records of temperature and climate that go back a thousand years show there's been about four or five tenths of a degree Fahrenheit variation naturally in our temperature over the last thousand years. And uh, what we've seen since 1900 is an increase of about a degree and a half Fahrenheit. So for me, uh, I'm willing to accept that about a third of the warming we're seeing 
is natural and the other two-thirds are likely caused by humans and greenhouse gases. So one of the things we like to do if there's snow left on the glacier is, is try to probe to last summer's surface and this will give us an independent measurement uh, on our melt. We're headed that way, same elevation. So I named my daughter after that mountain. Middle name, Shuxon. These measurements of change in glacial volume are directly linked to other research projects in the network of national parks in Washington, including the outburst flood study by Paul Kennard and the ice velocity measurements by Laura Walkup at Mount Rainier National Park. The reason that alpine glaciers flow downhill is because they have so much mass that they're being pulled by gravity down slope. My research is looking at the velocity field of the Nisqually Glacier. And what we're doing is we're coming out at the same time each week and we're surveying in the locations of individual rocks that are either riding along on top of the glacier or even entrained in the glacial ice. And then coming back week to week, we can calculate how much that rock has moved. And then we can take all of that data together and figure out what the velocity of the glacier is. So the upper part of our survey zone is moving a little over two feet per day. And then the lower portion, some are moving a couple inches a day. So the front of the glacier is moving a whole lot slower than the higher portions. One of the reasons that we care about this is because the speed of the glacier can be related to whether or not the glacier might kick out a glacial outburst flood. And that can cause a lot of flooding downstream. With climate change, you have warming temperatures and you also have more precipitation falling as rain rather than snow. So the glaciers are shrinking and the summer's warmer and the summer's longer, then you, you'll get more melt, which means that you have more water underneath the glacier that has the potential of being stored up and released as an outburst flood. It's going to be substantially warmer 50, 100 years from now. If you think of people that live on an island in the Pacific, uh, that's five feet above sea level, and they're gonna lose a lot. They're gonna lose their culture, they're gonna lose their land, they're gonna lose everything. Now here locally, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, less snowfall in the winter, uh, a rising winter snow line, and as a result of that, tree line is rising. Uh, the spring melt season is starting earlier and earlier, and uh, basically with the loss of glaciers, we're losing our water resources. It's important to do this over a long period of time in part because our climate is so variable. You know, if you just did this for five or ten years, you could get a pretty different picture of what's been happening. The parks present a great opportunity because not only do we have glaciers, but a lot of our park systems are fairly well intact, so when we measure change, it's easier to relate it to, to the cause. I think the Park Service has a pretty important role to play because we do a lot of interpretation of the public, and we're seeing these changes in the park. And so it's kind of a natural for us to hook those two together uh, and present this information to the public and, and give them an idea of what's happening. The rhythms of our lives may seem weak, especially in the din of the city. In these mountains, the Earth's rhythm is strong and its pattern is a big part of this place and our lives in it. Glaciers and their creations remind us of our helplessness in the face of ice ages, 
and of our dependence on the interglacial climate for food and for development of our civilizations and cultures. Here, the big ice ages dominate the rhythm at 100,000 year intervals. We exist dependent on the warmth between ice ages. Fainter, less frequent beats remind us of other patterns to life here. Some come by the millennium, others by the decade, but each is recorded in the glaciers and glacial landscapes of the North Cascades. They remind us of our past and give perspective to our future. Who wrote that?